vamos começar. É, I would like first to say something for the people who are not who does not belong to our department. Every Friday we have a colloquium in the department. We have some visitors that come here to talk about one hour for the, the whole department. And this week, as uh, we have this symposium, so the person who will speak in the symposium, he will also make the colloquium of the department. And the speaker is uh, Professor Oban Kaizen. Uh, I, I write something here about him. So he, he did his thesis at the Colombo here in Paris in 1990, working with the cooling of atoms by lasers. He was supervised by Professor Claude Cohen Tanuji, who probably all of you know because of the quantum mechanics book. But Claude Cohen Tanuji, he was a, he is a Nobel Prize, and he is also a honoris causa professor of this department of the, this university. Uh, it was how many years ago? He was I don't remember. Uh, I think it was about uh, 20 years ago, he was appointed as a, a professor of honoris causa of this university. So, Robert Kaiser, he did experiments on cooling of atoms at that time, and he succeeded to do a very diff a difficult experiments that uh, uh, he reached some uh, record in this thing of uh, cooling of atoms at that time. Uh, after uh, after this, he stayed as a postdoc at Harvard University, where he worked with uh, uh, in a group that was uh, working with uh, problems related to antimatter. As far as I remember, I, I Gabrielson was the supervisor. He is a leader of one uh, group at the CNRS that is in competition with uh, the group of uh, at Gaudium looking for this antimatter atom, uh, atoms. Uh, so after this postdoc, uh, Robin went to France, back to France. He was hired by the Institute of Optics in Ossain and worked in atomic optics uh, under supervision, supervisor, supervision of uh, Alan Aspect. And uh, he developed uh, mirrors for atoms. Uh, in 1997, he joined the Institute of Nonlinear Science in uh, Nice. That's the place where he's working now. That's University uh, in Côte d'Azur, uh, where he is working with uh, coolant vapors, coolant atomic vapors and many other subjects related to coolant atoms, uh, uh, localization of uh, light, uh, lens flights, right? Well, so he visited Brazil many times, many, many times, I don't know how many, but I think I saw him many times here in Brazil, either in here or at Sao Paulo, even at Fernando Doroy, right? that was one of his last visits <laughs> to Brazil. Uh, he received in his lab many Brazilian students. Uh, there are some students that were there to, go, to be uh, to work in their in their thesis. That was uh, uh, supervised by by Robert. So today he'll be uh, talk to us on this subject that is in here, and I. As I heard from him, he will make some connections with these uh, many things of, that was discussed during this uh, symposium. So you have a microphone already. So I thank you very much for to be here, to accept our invitation, and I hope that you come here many times more in the future. Okay, so thank you very much for this kind of introduction, and uh, indeed I have been in Brazil many, many times. Uh, probably it's a country, at least scientifically, which I have visited most outside France. Uh, 
and uh, I will uh, come back to this in the next slide. So, in first, uh, 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 I have to thank all the funding agencies, which is very important because uh, uh, if you have many of them and uh, some very important ones, this allows us to make a lot of collaboration with it and uh, uh, hire people from outside, among which uh, many people from Russia. So, it's very important to get this funding, of course. Uh, but even more important than the funding uh, is the people with whom you, with whom you can work. And uh, so in France we have this uh, situation uh, where we have a lot of uh, permanent staff working in one team together. Uh, uh, and so the present team uh, in Nice is composed by Guillaume Laverie, I start from the back, who first joined me when I moved to Nice, William Guerin, who joined us uh, five years ago, five or six years ago, and Mathieu Fouché, who joined us two or three years ago. Uh, the presence of these permanent people is extremely important because this gives you long-term memory. Uh, and uh, this means if there's something broken, they remember how it was done 10 years ago. Uh, this is uh, very, very important. It's even more important than money. Uh, good memory in how to solve problems, uh, this is these people. Uh, these people, actually, they don't like to travel so much. Mathilde is coming to Brazil every now and then, so you might get Mathilde here. The other is more difficult to get them uh, outside France. But this allows me to be free and travel. So I'm the salesman, and they are really the uh, producers of the science. Uh, really, it's really important. Uh, up to a point where, to speak here, I, I think, I hope I can answer all the questions which will arise. But the detailed things is really in the minds of these people. So it's, uh, it's really, really important. And then, of course, uh, 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 three person learn could not do all the science I will present. Uh, well, this is done over many, many years by many students and postdocs. Uh, and so over here, I, I, uh, this is the most recent team, so I put in bold the Brazilians. All over the place, you see there's a lot of bold characters here. All this is my Brazilian connection. So uh, a very important Brazilian connection. So we have Michel uh, doing a PhD on subradians, so this is one of the main topics uh, I will discuss here. Uh, Alvaro will join us for the next main topic, uh, which is really uh, probably the highlight, I hope, to become the highlight of my career. So that's what we'll be doing in the next few years. It's really a very important moment in my career. Uh, then we have postdocs. Uh, Raoli came from here. Uh, uh, okay, I, I work with Tabosa, Anderson, we have a collaboration together. Uh, uh, Thomas Wacky from Natal, Vandale Bagnato. Uh, Thierry from Pessoa, so you see that many, many people are from Abashna, very, very important project. You see, uh, I have a very, very strong Brazilian connection, and uh, 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 I'm just uh, one element in a chain of a long tradition in this French Brazilian uh, interaction. And so we make a lot of effort right now in France uh, to keep this type of uh, what we call GDRP, uh, so international collaborations, uh, even though the financial situation now might be more difficult here. Uh, I really push hard that we can keep this connection, that people continue visiting, and that there's no uh, uh, broken uh, timing for many years where there will be no connection. It's really important. I was trained and educated by Claude Quantanogy that you have to go to other, see other people, and, so, and I want to transmit this behavior and uh, tradition to the next generation. So it's really important that we make a strong effort on the political level to keep this uh, uh, working. And okay, I have many other collaborations, but I will not speak about this uh, here. Uh, okay, so um, then let's come a little bit to science. So um, what we do uh, in this, uh, so we do code atoms, because basically that's what I learned when I started my PhD. Uh, and uh, when I moved to NIS, uh, you have to come up with something uh, different, else you won't get money. So you have to say, I do something new, something different. Uh, and you, have, you better find something uh, which no one else is doing. Because if the big groups are already doing it when you start, so when I started in this, uh, a small group, nothing, so we have to get an idea where uh, the other groups don't work on. So uh, it's very difficult to get a good idea where the other people don't work on. But if it's a good idea, many people work on it. So uh, what I choose as an idea is something where most people would know it exists, but they thought it's, it's garbage. It's not interesting, it's just dirty physics. Uh, because basically, in the community of later, uh, called, uh, called atoms, everything was more or less pure. Uh, and in France, so the French school, as we say, we, we always start from Hamiltonians and so on, uh, and we want to understand everything at the very fundamental level. So we want to have a very clean situation. What I choose to study is a dirty situation. So I 
I got some ideas because I, I went to conferences outside of the Colgate community just to shop, to get some ideas. Do shopping in ideas, make cooking, and then you come up with something, maybe, sometimes. Uh, and my idea was to study multiple scattering of light in cold light. That was, okay, I wanted to study this. Uh, and uh, many people knew that there is multiple scattering of light in cold light, so that's not a new idea. But people thought this is a bad situation, it's something to avoid. Because basically, uh, in the 90s, uh, multiple scattering of light would avoid you to reach post-action condensation. So it's a enemy number one, number one. Public enemy number one, multiple scattering. It avoided, it prevented us to do B post-action condensation. So get rid of it. So people get rid of it by switching off the laser and doing electric craft evaporation and all this. And I chose to study this thing where people try to avoid. So uh, that's the way how I could make something new where no one else was really on the competing side. If, if the big groups would have done this, I would have no chance to do anything. So my choice was, okay, do multiple scattering of light in cold atoms. Cold atoms I know what to do. Multiple scattering, we need many particles. And uh, so uh, the only idea I really had, all the other ideas came from all the other people around, basically, is uh, to use uh, uh, a, a big container of glass to make large laser beams. Because if you make large laser beams, you can trap more atoms. Uh, this has been known, so it's not my new idea. So people knew that uh, if you have a, a, a laser beam and you change the size of the laser beam uh, by a factor of two, you get two to the fourth more atoms. So it's an in incredible increase in number of atoms if you increase the size of your laser beam. But most mirrors you have is one inch mirrors. So most people work with one inch mirrors. And then they are stuck with this. And then they stay with uh, below 10 to 9 atoms. So I said, okay, let's just buy bigger mirrors. And uh, bigger mirrors, we also need a bigger container to, where to put the lasers in the glass. So I just took, uh, bought a glass cell 10 centimeters on each side. And that was the, the original thing I did. Take a big piece of glass and larger laser beams. And you need to have a little bit of money to have more power to separate lasers. But uh, this is the one difference. So study something no one else wanted to study and have some trick to have a, a, a parameter which is different from what most people have. And then the rest is just doing, of course, a lot of hard work, studying things in detail, trying to understand step by step and move on. So this was the seed, and even uh, now this is our working world, large cloud of code added. And we do many things with this. So we do what I will discuss uh, later in the talk, uh, take a subradiance, maybe under localization, but with uh, time I spend all this, I will probably not get to this, <coughs> not a problem. Uh, we do uh, pattern formation, which very nice self-organized pattern, which we have this uh, antiphromatic phases, parametric phases, other type of uh, structural, uh, self-organized structures coming around. Um, we also have, uh, you can see this, uh, back to this. Oh, it doesn't work. Uh, we have sometimes, we have the, the large cloud of cold atoms, which is uh, getting unstable, and it looks like a flame in the chimney. You look at it, and it's always changing, it's always a different thing. And people also, people have seen this before, some other people have seen this before, and uh, when they told the student, um, make me a big mod, and the student said, oh, it's getting unstable, but if I change the detuning, I move larger out of, away from resonance, it becomes stable. So all the supervisors say, go out of resonance, get me a stable mod, and then we work. And I said, no, no, we're going to study this. And so uh, this is kind of plasma physics. And uh, so this part here, we're still studying this. Uh, it's in, uh, and there's instability. In some limits, this behaves like uh, an oscillating cloud, and this is very similar, and the equations are very similar to what happens in some stars. Uh, there are some stars which are os oscillating. They are called cepheids. <coughs> and uh, if you know the oscillation period and the brightness of the star which you see, you can get the distance where the stars are. So the cepheids, these oscillating stars, are uh, our uh, benchmark, our meter, to measure the size of the universe. So if you want to measure the size of the universe, you go to cepheids. And so we simulate cepheids and so on. So that's a easy thing. But in astrophysics, cepheids are really, really important. And uh, so we do other things. We did levy flights. I will not speak about this uh, here. That's something we did now. We, we, so we continue to do with uh, uh, Michel and Thierry. Uh, we did random lasing. And uh, so why did we do random lasing? Because uh, I was attracted to uh, astrophysics to some extent. Because of this unsteady cloud that was maybe in the first point of this. And um, in astrophysics, uh, you find all kinds of situations. As Sid said, uh, uh, if you think you invent something new on Earth, go and look around. Maybe some places in the universe it has been done. Uh, and so uh, random lasing might have been, might exist in space, 
but you, I want to detect it and prove that it's random lazy. And uh, to do this, uh, I need to open up my eye and look to the sky, and for this you need telescopes. And you need new techniques to detect uh, the difference between a random lasing star and a regular star. And we know from uh, laser optics that to make a difference between a laser and uh, uh, a light which is filtered and collimated, you need to measure uh, the intensity correlation function. You just measure the spectral width, you can take a, a, a thermal light, put two pinholes so it's attracted, put the filter there so it's narrow light. So how can I know if this is a, a, a broadband source which has been filtered and collimated, or it's a laser? To do this, this is, has been uh, developed by, in the 65 by Dauber, for instance, you measure the uh, intensity correlation function. So, uh, so the goal is to measure the intensity correlation function from light coming from stars, and see, oh, this star is a laser. So that's, that's our goal. And uh, the star we have in mind is Eta Carinet, which uh, is in the ring And uh, <coughs> to do this, so you need to get access to the telescopes. And uh, this is uh, not as expensive as CERN, but still, uh, this is an experiment, and the people who developed this experiment, they just don't give it to you and play with it. It's, uh, so they spent a lot of time to develop this, so you need a good argument to come with them and say, okay, let me play with your telescope. So we did a lot of experiments to prepare uh, the data analysis and the instruments in the lab with code atom techniques, and then we convinced some of the local people in, in this uh, to let us touch their uh, telescope, so we could go there and put screws on their telescopes and install our instrument and we measure intensity correlation, like this here, this is a proton function from a star, uh, which had been done by Hannu Brown and Twist in the 60s, uh, and uh, he has measured using this technique, very similar with two telescopes, he could measure the size, angular size of many of 30 stars, that's what he did. And uh, that was in the 60s, beginning of the 70s, and then uh, he wanted to co continue this technique because he could measure uh, the size of stars which no one else could measure. Uh, and from this, he could go back to the temperature of stars and classify stars. So it was a very good, important technique, this Hangarong technique, the uh, Hangarong Chris technique, was very important for uh, astrophysics. It was very important for quantum optics because this experiment triggered the effort by Glauber, who got a Nobel Prize some years ago for the one. Uh, to explain this experiment, Glauber did the quantum theory of that, the quantum statistics. So this was, uh, this was a really fundamental uh, experiment which was initially developed by uh, uh, radio uh, 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 So not people from quantum optics who developed this technique. Okay, so... Uh, what was the uh, what was the Okay, so uh, anyway, so with this uh, uh, detail I give on the, on the second slide, I will not come to the 20th slide, but it's not a problem. I just tell you stories how we uh, proceed. So we have to convince the people that we can use their telescopes. So we de developed a technique, and we are compared to what happened in the 70s. Nowadays, we're very good because technology has made a lot of progress. So we, uh, in order to be at the state of the art, you have to be at the state of the art of technology. So you go to the best detectors, best correlators, and you and you uh, see how, we stay, how can they improve. So the companies who do the best correlators, they discuss with us and they improve their correlators so that they can do this type of experiments. So why did Henry Brown stop in the, in the 70s? Uh, because so he wanted to measure the size of the star, and uh, he came to Nice, actually, and he met uh, someone called Antoine Laberie, who is the father of Guillaume Laberie. Uh, and Antoine Laberie is the father of uh, amplitude interferometry. So instead of uh, detecting the intensity on one telescope and the intensity on the other telescope and make correlation function, uh, what Antoine Laberie did, he took the light and uh, combined it with it like a Michaelson uh, interferometer, so optically making the interference pattern in the middle here. This is very, very delicate because you have distances of uh, many tens or now hundreds, nowadays hundreds of meters, so you have to line an interferometer up hundreds of meters. So when Andrew Brown came to Nice and saw the fringes, Antoine Laberie was able to see in Calais, not exactly here, but meters away from this building here, that's where Antoine Laberie worked. Uh, Antoine Laberie could see the fringes in real time. And uh, this technique you need to integrate for many hours. <coughs> so then Hans Rambaud said, I will stop my technique, I will try to copy your technique. And so that was the end of intensity correlation, because amplitude interferometry 
were so much successful, and this developed over the last decades, and this is what we have now in Shara in the US, and the VLTI in, 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 in the Chile uh, is the successor of this technique developed by Ontology. And so that's why everyone stopped. So why should we do it again? Well, I was interested in random lasing, that's why I wanted to do it. And uh, to convince my astrophysics colleague to borrow me their telescopes, uh, I convinced them that if you can do with intensity correlation, you can make a separation between the two telescopes, which can be 500 meters, one kilometer apart, so you can get a much better resolution. If you do a microscope, you need a large uh, uh, aperture. The larger the aperture, the better the resolution is you have. The aperture we have for astrophysics is the distance between the two telescopes. And the star is very far away, so the neural aperture is ridiculous. But you can still increase it by making the distance between the two telescopes larger and larger. So if you can go from 100 meters to 1 kilometer, you win a factor of 10 in the resolution. This means you can resolve uh, more distance uh, uh, objects, or their dream is to resolve exoplanets, and even to resolve structures on exoplanets. So we look at oceans on exoplanets and so on. So it's, uh, uh, they, they dream a lot, uh, and they project themselves 100 years in the future, but we need new technology to do microscopy in astrophysics. So this is uh, intensity correlation. It's probably a tool to do this, not in the next 10 years, but maybe in 100 years. So it's, uh, and so this technique, this is why I, I could convince the astrophysics people to borrow me their telescopes, and I want to do random lasing in space. But uh, okay, so we do a lot of papers now for uh, um, optical imaging of stars with the uh, vein, but I really developed the intensity correlation technique. So you see, the technique we use, uh, so we developed this here for, for uh, astrophysics, and then we went to the, uh, back to the lab, and it was extremely easy, once we optimized this for astrophysics, to implement it in the uh, cold atom setup. It was much easier to use it with cold atoms than with astrophysics. So this was much harder, even though cold atoms seemed to be a difficult system. Uh, this was an easy experiment to intensify correlation with the atoms was much easier than with uh, astrophysics. And uh, once we have developed this technique, and as I want to do random lasing in, in space, I want to know if I have a, uh, if eta carina is a random laser, uh, what is the signature? What should I detect? So I want to detect G2, and I need to see a change if it's a random lasing or amplified spontaneous emission below or above threshold. And uh, to test this, so we did an experiment with cold atoms, random lasing with cold atoms. This was a very painful, hard experiment. Uh, so you could redo this again to see what is the change in G2 if I have a random laser. But then I met Anderson, uh, and he has a nice fiber laser, so that's the same we, we discussed. Uh, so uh, Anderson came with the random fiber laser to NIST, and we plugged this into our detector here, and we measured G2 on the random laser, and we got surprises. I will not go into all details. We, some, some things were as expected. We go from thermal light to a coherent light, but there was other uh, surprises, and we still work on the interpretation of these surprises. So you see that uh, from cold atoms to astrophysics, uh, via random fiber lasers, all of this is a common topic of uh, how to understand photons, quantum optics of photons. So we do all this, and uh, yeah, so we, we could even convince people at the large telescope in Chile that we could plug our telescope in there, and it works, and we were happy. Okay, uh, there are other things, I will not go into detail on this, because uh, I will never come to uh, what I want to discuss today, which is uh, scattering of light by cold atoms. So now I come back to the cold atoms. Uh, on Monday, I already discussed things about random walk, uh, and uh, all corrections to, uh, due to the, diff to the diff diffusion coefficient. Now I will speak about uh, the quest uh, of analysis localization, which is a big goal. Uh, this is uh, what I sold uh, to the funding agency when I went to this. Nice. I said, I want to do this. That was more than 20 years ago. And uh, no big progress, basically, uh, but many other things which came out uh, of this type of research. And then, <coughs> more recently, um, we had to make a big detour so we wanted to go to another localization. We had done current back scattering, which I discussed, I will just come shortly back on this uh, in the end of the 90s. And then we make a very big detour around uh, cooperative scattering deeply separated, which is uh, hopefully I can get to this part in my talk here. Um, please let me look like five or ten minutes before the morning for the end of the <coughs> And then uh, if I have time, I will uh, tell you how uh, we think we can uh, do under circles of light, even though no one has seen it so far. But, uh, we have some tricks, some ideas uh, how to do this. Okay, so this is uh, 
Is there any slide you should remember from this talk? Is this one? Um, and so I will again spend some time on this slide. The rest will be details. Technical details, equations, uh, curves. Yeah, there's no curve, there are figures, pictures, people here, and some uh, just flashy words, some uh, just uh, uh, selling arguments. So what's the idea? The idea is, as I said, so uh, uh, let's consider all of us we are a cloud of code patterns. So every one of you is a code pattern. And um, I want to uh, localize light in this cloud of code atoms. So there are different ways how to localize light in the cloud of code atoms. One is uh, I throw a photon in the center, and the photon forgot that it has any wave effect. It's a particle. It just jumps from one <coughs> atom to the other atom. And before it can leave, uh, it depends uh, how far it can jump, how big step it can do, and depends on the sample size. Okay, random walk. Uh, diffusively going out of the water, so the larger the sample, the longer it will take. Okay. So that's a, a multiple scattering, uh, random walk, no interference with that. Then there are two effects, how you can keep the photon in the sample for a long time, which depend on the fact that the that photons are waves and that there's an interference effect. One is our goal, under localization, and that would be a kind of situation where like uh, five cold atoms here, share one photon, and this photon will go around in loops, a little bit what we saw in this uh, random lazy part, but without gain, so just a linear uh, scattering problem, so the photon will go around in some localized loop here, and the other part of the cloud doesn't know that there's a photon going around in loop here, and the photon is just trapped by itself, so it's its tail all the time, it doesn't go around. That's under localization. The other method which uh, uh, I will describe a little more in detail now, is uh, a thickest up radiance, this is a photon, this is shared among the whole cloud, so everyone knows that there's a photon around, but you just oscillate in and out of phase in such a way that the photon does not uh, escape. So there's like a, a, a super radiant sym sym symmetric oscillation, and then there are anti symmetric modes, and these anti symmetric modes make that the photon wants to leave, but then it interferes with another thing and it doesn't leave. So that's, it's an interference effect, but it's a global interference effect. It's not local. So this is a local interference effect, that's the holy grail. And this is a global interference effect which we stumbled on by accident, more or less. And this is what I will. So this we have seen. This is easy to do. Glass of milk in the kitchen. Remember one day? That's an easy experiment. Uh, this is more difficult. Uh, and this no one has seen so far. So this is uh, our future project. Alvaro has to be uh, brave and uh, believe it can work. Because if you don't think it can work, you will not. So if you can do this in the next three or four years, that would be great. Uh, Every step here typically takes more than three or four years, but we'll see. Okay, so, um, uh, let me see, I started at half past four, yeah, so I mean, so the under localization uh, is a very old story. Uh, uh, I will not go into detail. What is important in the community of under localization that the dimension of the problem is very important. Uh, so it's, uh, it's different in 1, 2, and 3D. And uh, in 1 and 2D, basically everything is solved, everything is known. Not everything, but most things are known. There's no controversy in 1 and 2D. In 3D, uh, uh, it's an open question. Uh, and uh, the story is <coughs> that, uh, so Anderson proposed this in the end of the 50s, so more than 50 years ago, uh, to explain the difference between a conductor and an insulator. Uh, if you have a, a wave which is localized here, it cannot go from this side of the sample to the other side of the sample. So it, there's no conductance, no transport. So it's an insulator. And he came up with this disorder-induced interference effect which would make you an insulator. That was the understanding. idea. And many people, very smart, clever people, come uh, with uh, <coughs> a universal theory, uh, and uh, this is one of them, scaling theory of localization, which shows that in 1 and 2D there's no problem. In 3D there's a critical uh, disorder, so it's very difficult in 3D. Uh, what I mentioned here is that uh, this scaling theory is assumed to be universal. What does it mean universal? It means I take uh, a sample of code atoms, you take a sample of uh, uh, a random laser, fiber laser, another one take a red uh, milk or white powder, something like a powder. It should not depend on details. It's universal. So once you know one or two uh, properties of the sample, uh, the details do not matter. So the idea in the community over the last what, 40 years was that there's a universal scaling theory of localization and details are not important. Okay, so, uh, and uh, I, I say it now, 
the, the result, now we know the details are very important. This picture does not hold any longer. Because details make a big difference. And, uh, I can tell you which details later if I have time, but uh, 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 this was uh, accepted by the whole community. And so if you go against the common wisdom, you have to fight a lot. So many people say, if you, if you con contest this, you have to have very good arguments, very good numerical and experimental results to say this is wrong. But this is absolutely accepted by still today 99.99% of the community. And my claim is it's wrong. So uh, uh, you can cite me on this, I will fight this. Uh, and most people will still not agree with me now, but I hope that in a few years I can convince the rest of them. So this, uh, this statement that uh, this is not universal is absolutely controversial. So, uh, you don't have to believe me, I have my opinion, and I will fight for my opinion. Okay, um, so now I will focus just on the three-dimensional case, but that's where there's controversy. And I will only focus on waves which are uh, photons. Okay? So the same thing happens for uh, electrons, acoustic waves, matter waves, but I will focus on photons. And the, uh, the oh yeah, so this is uh, in 3D, so people have done this with acoustics. Uh, John Page in Canada has done this in end of 2000, and he has uh, beads here. These are kind of resonators, and if you put the acoustic wave, it oscillates, so that's a resonator. And these resonators, they are uh, right together, so there's like a, a, a contact they make between the different uh, beads, and depending on the size of the contact, the connection is bigger or smaller, so the randomness between the contacts of all these beads, and this gives you the random uh, network uh, of beads which uh, where he showed unsurprisation uh, of acoustic waves. Uh, in uh, cold atoms, uh, there have been uh, things which are mimicking there's an analog on the kick rotor on 3D unsurprisation. This is, uh, uh, once you accept the analogy, uh, it's exactly the same model as the Anderson model, which is not the case for real photons. And with matter waves, there has been experiments done uh, in uh, Palaiso by Alain Stey, uh, in Gushebrook in, in Florence uh, have done this. And they also have signature, signatures of uh, uh, expansion, which is frozen if there's a disordered potential on the atoms. But so I will stick to light in 3D. And uh, again, so this is, uh, I will speak about these two uh, experiments here. Uh, these are two groups uh, uh, which uh, convinced me that it's interesting to study multiple scattering of light in cold atoms. So I owe everything I do now to these two groups, even though now uh, you will see uh, they they cannot claim what they wanted to claim, but without their investigations, I could not understand what they understand now. So, uh, even, uh, and this is unfortunate nowadays, even a failed experiment might bring you a lot of information. It's very hard to publish failed experiments. Okay, so we know what this. But it's really important, because you know why they fail. You have to understand why do they fail. And uh, so, uh, <coughs> um, there was another experiment, another, so I uh, also told this in uh, uh, Jean-Michel Raymond told me we have to do something against this. So there has been a paper in the beginning of the 90s by Azik Enak, another person. So this, this, this expert here is at Lavendike, so that's the name of the thing you have to know. Uh, other people have to know. Uh, Georg Barret, another one, and Azik Enak. These are really pioneers in this community. Azik Enak published a paper in 91, I think, in Peral, where he claimed to have seen understocalization of, of electromagnetic waves. Uh, in 3D. Uh, it was a little bit not very sharp evidence in the experimental data, and uh, nowadays he absolutely is clear about this that this was absorption, so it was mass absorption. But there was no comment on the paper he did, and he didn't publish any paper later, all the way he said this is wrong. So if you just go to the literature, you find a paper where it says, I've seen other organization of electronic waves in 3D. And, but the community, we, we know it's wrong. And so, uh, uh, Jean-Michel Raymond told me, oh, you should make a comment. But the comment, nowadays, if you do comment on paper, it's considered to be impressive. And it's a very good, so we are friends. So we don't want to publish a comment. So there are papers out there uh, which claim something and everyone knows it's wrong. So you have to be careful what you do. Not only in the journal media, there's well, fake news. But there's something which is not absolutely established and the experts we know. So. Uh, at least something where you should not throw away the older generations. We have heard many things and we know many things. When you have a good idea, 
come and ask the, the previous generation. As I did for, I asked these people, these are, they are one generation before me, and I learned many things from them. And so, uh, don't trust everything you read in the paper. Be critical. Try to understand. Are you convinced of the data? Look at the data. Look at the equation. Uh, is this correct? Or don't trust the titles. Look at least at the equations and the figures. The text is something that the authors wrote. They can write. And they convince two or three or four people. They're free. So, okay, that's what they do so bad. But they can write. The data, so far we trust that in the community we don't falsify data. If you accept this, go to the data. Look at the data. What would you do with the data? Would you uh, uh, interpret the data the same way the author did? Maybe you don't have it. They give you an idea and then say, oh yeah, that was a good idea. Look at the data and the equations it is for you. Okay, so um, this said, it's getting a, a, a very slow progress, but I was told not to go too fast for the details. So, it's, um, uh, so what, what did Atlas and I do? So I told you on Monday that uh, uh, under localization of flight, you want to have the Euphor Regi criterion uh, which means, so it's a random walk of flight, so there's a mean free pass, and one step, another step, another step. And if this step size is of the order of the wavelengths, optical wavelengths, then we might accept under uh, expect under circulation of light. So you need something which, uh, where light makes very s small steps. So again, I take my glass of milk. If I put a lot of water into it, uh, the photons can go very far before they hit another milk protein, whatever, before being scattered. If I take away the water, it's shorter paths. So the goal is, how ca short can you make uh, this mean field pass? And this depends on the density of scatters we have and on the cross-section. And the cross-section depends on the change of index of refraction. So the idea of Atlantic was to take semiconductor powders, which have a very strong change of index of refraction in the optical regime, you go from one air to three and something for the powder. And uh, he uh, had very small mean field pass, close to KL equal to one. And then he went to this universal scaling theory of uh, localization, and there's some prediction how the total transmission, like this Ohm's law for photon, should be modified if you are at the transition. And it should uh, scale like 1 over L squared here. And he got this data here, and he said, oh, this is consistent with analysis localization of light. And so he published this paper here with Dieter Biesma, who's now a famous guy in running lasing as well. Uh, and so they published this. Two years later, uh, Frank Scheffel and Georg Maret, basically, they published a comment and they say, what you saw here could also be explained by absorption. Okay, so this was a uh, uh, this was big claim. So yeah, okay, basically he wanted to go to Stockholm that time and this this. And Georg Maret said, no, 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 this is absorption. Uh, you have to convince that that is not the self. And, uh, and so this was a little bit tense in the community. And uh, many years later, so there was a lot of other experiments to test the details of the prediction. And in 2012, at Lachendijk, author of this paper, he said, no, okay, what I saw here can be explained by absorption. So uh, this is very important. So uh, I really admire, and I come back to the same here, uh, at Lachendijk for this. It was one of the biggest claims in his career. And some years later, taking into account the comments by the community, he says, okay, you're right. I was wrong. He admits that he could have more interpretation. It was consistent, so this is a very hard experiment, so very, and very deep knowledge how to make scaling laws data analysis. But at the end of the 10 years later, he said, no, okay, uh, you're right, I cannot claim the observation of uh, But we learned during these uh, decades here, uh, the community learned a lot about what problems you can have if you go for the observation of If you don't know what they uh, discovered, what problems they have, and you try to do it, uh, it's hopeless. So there are so many problems you can face. If you don't learn the lessons from these people, uh, you, you, you can go in the same trap as they called in uh, 20 years ago. So Georg Maret, one of the uh, authors here, he had the idea to get rid of this problem of absorption by doing time resolved experiments. Okay? And with this, somehow you can get rid of the absorption problem, that's the knowledge. And uh, so he took white paint and compressed it a lot. Uh, and he could also get very short mean free paths. And, uh, the, the beauty of the uh, uh, universal scaling law theory is that it doesn't depend if it's white paint or similar powders. The bad thing, it doesn't give you quantitative prediction. It doesn't tell you if KL should be 1, 2.6, 1 point, uh, uh, 0.01. Uh, it just oh, it scales like KL. And it should be of the only unit. But there could be a factor of 2 pi cube in front. And 2 pi cube is a big number. Or it could be 1 over 2 pi cube. Is a big number. So you don't, we don't know. 
So they are all in the regime where things might have happened. And so what, uh, what uh, Georg Barrett saw is the coming of house. So the red line here would be uh, this um, uh, random walk model I showed you on Monday would predict this red curve here. And what Georg Barrett saw is that there was light trapped in the system for longer than what you expect by testing the fuel. And so he said, well, wow, great, under localization flight. It's consistent with under localization flight. Uh, very quickly after this, so this was very fast, and the community was aware that there were problems. Why? Because, of course, you go to many conferences with this. You're invited in all the conferences to speak about this. And, uh, of course, you always, uh, it's like the French king, you go somewhere, you have all your court, all your followers who come with you, right? And they don't speak, but they have posters. And uh, so you go to the posters, and you speak to the students, the posters, and you get information you would not get from the main people. So it's a go to the poster session, you get information. So we knew that there was some trouble already in this. And what was the trouble? The trouble was that uh, to get light through, uh, this, uh, most of the photons, uh, if it's a very localized example, most of the photons would come back, so almost no photons go through. So he had to crank up the power of his laser a lot, and it was not in the linear optics regime. And uh, he excited a, a higher level of this white paint, and it was fluorescence of the white paint. So this slope here is a nonlinear effect and fluorescence of the white paint. And uh, by adding filters to, get, to only look at the light at the same frequency as the input light, this effect disappeared. And so this is uh, acknowledged in this paper here by Georg Mallet, saying, OK, the community was right. I, so he struggled a lot. And you can see that Frank Schoffel, who was with Georg Barrett, uh, making comment this paper, was with other people making comment with Georg Barrett. So uh, he was uh, uh, in, in troubled water. He's still trying to look for localization as well now, so he's more as my generation. But he was very brave. If you put a comment against someone, typically he's no longer your friend. So it's a, it's a dangerous thing. It should not be like this. It's not good. But it's a little bit like this. So, um, OK, so these are the two best experiments by the best experts in the field we try to do this, and uh, we learn problems from that. So the state of the art of the day is that no one has observed under the of light in three dimensions. And so uh, why should we do it? Because we have different samples. We have cold atoms, and we like cold atoms. So we, the main thing we add to this community is that instead of semiconductor powders or white paint, we take cold atoms. And we hope that with cold atoms, we don't have absorption, we don't have the fluorescence, so we can uh, we start from Hamiltonian, the French school, so we start from Hamiltonian, drive equations, and then you go to what you observe, and so on. So we have the, this is uh, more an engineering problem, right? You, you have properties and try to optimize the properties. Uh, the French way is you start from Hamiltonian, so it uh, sometimes takes more time. This is, um, I told this to, I think, Bill Phillips, I was, uh, 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 the French could never have done uh, post ancient content because the most ancient content does not derive from a Hamiltonian. <laughs> you need evaporation. So the French school was not prepared for a most ancient content. No, it's, it's, so it was a different attitude. So, uh, okay, I come with the French attitude to solve this dirty physics problem. When I went to, from Paris so, uh, to Nice, you have to convince the French school that you can do this, that, you, that is a good way to do it. And Claude Cantangy uh, said, that's dirty physics. <laughs> he didn't like it. But okay, he, and, but he said, okay, Robert, okay, he's a serious guy, let him do it. But it's a waste of this, we educate the people in this nice French school way, and then he does dirty physics. So, okay, so I did it anyway, but I, I saw his disappointment <laughs> that I was studying dirty physics with Hamiltonians and cold atoms. So, so okay. Uh, so it, it, there's a lot of things, uh, cultural things in science as well. It, it's, uh, and it's, uh, uh, once you realize this, you can take benefit from different systems. So, uh, as we discussed with Anderson, I'm now very flexible with dirty models, which uh, in my PhD time I would not have been allowed to do. <laughs> I do things today I would not be allowed to do. I can accept things nowadays I, could, I would not have been allowed to accept uh, many years ago. But so there are different systems, and every approach has its advantage and uh, difference. So, you have to acknowledge the difference in attitude and approach from different systems. Okay, so. Uh, ah. Uh, okay, so let's move on. So, uh, random walk, I discussed this. Uh, we can do uh, scattering experiments and look for uh, just random walking cold atoms, I discussed this. So, uh, this uh, diffuse transmission, we can do this with uh, 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 cold atoms. So, this is the equivalent of uh, Atlanta Nights experiment. Just look at how much light is going through. 
uh, Georg Maret had this time result experiment, which we can do as well with code atoms, because typically the time scales are much slower, so it's much easier to detect time dependent experiments with code atoms compared to white paper. So uh, this we did, I think I described this as well. So this we know. Uh, we can look at interference effect. We know that photons are waves even with code atoms. Uh, and we look at this uh, current backscattering effect where we have interference effect between this path and this path. And this is an interference effect in multiple scattering. I described this on Monday. Uh, we don't go back into too much detail now again on this. So what you can you see, you have a speckle field. And if you do the configuration average, you see this signature of interference effect in multiple scattering. So this is, uh, when we did this, uh, just to tell you some story, so this was done in 98, 1999. Uh, I went to this in 97, and I got the idea, I discussed this idea with Ad like in 95 in Davos. There was a conference in Davos. And I said, oh, okay, you did scattering, I can do this with cold atoms. Uh, uh, and when we published this, uh, I went up again and said, wow, it took you four years to do this? Just to change the sample, because they change the sample in no time, right? They have the later, the other sample. Four years to change the sample, wow. <laughs> you will not go very far. So it's, uh, okay, so it's okay. At, uh, okay, it's more difficult to prepare this sample, but it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, four years was a long time. I was happy that I got this so well. Okay, and um, then we, uh, of course, so we learned this. So this means that we are invited to the conferences of this community. So now we can learn more and more from them, with them, uh, and we learn many things about uh, internal structures, so we have a regular criteria. Other people uh, are trying to do the same thing. Uh, this is now possible in a couple of experiments, so uh, several labs in the world fulfill this criteria, but no one has seen other supernatural sites so far. And one problem might be that the rubidium atoms have the Zeeman uh, structure in the ground state, which acts like small magnets, and they might cause problem for localization. And so this is why we now want to uh, go for an atom which has no structure in the ground state. Uh, strontium was a choice in the end of the 90s for us, and now our best choice is Italium for technical details. Okay, so, um, so uh, why not just go directly to this uh, strontium? Uh, in the mid of the 2000s, so uh, we did this work basically between 1998 and 2005, then one of my collaborators at that time, David Lipovsky, he moved to Singapore. Guillaume Laberry moved to Dubai uh, with angel condensation, so I was basically alone. Okay, so uh, then it's uh, getting hard times, right? You, uh, then you suffer. And then you do uh, experiments, so you, you cannot uh, directly go for the big goal, but it's, it's too much effort. And if you don't have the manpower, the money, uh, you have to look for new ideas. So uh, we did some experiments uh, just to play a little bit with things, and we found uh, and the, so actually, I, I discussed with Philippe Corte, who now is in San Carlos. He was at that time in tubing, and he was doing what is called a collective atomic recoil laser, which is like the, the recoil induced resonance scheme in the cavity. And uh, when you come on, so if you're all cold methods again, you come on with laser beam. If you scatter light in the backward direction, it will interfere with the incoming beam and make a standing wave pattern. And, that, and then there's a feedback of the motion of the atoms, and atoms will bunch in the grating and the feedback will get stronger and stronger. So that's called quick collective uh, atom atom uh, quick laser if you put this in the cavity. And I asked Philip, uh, he had a very good cavity. I think that's of ten to the fifth or something. Okay. I don't like cavities, I don't want to put anything in the vacuum chamber. So I asked him, what happens if your cavity has a bad finesse? Ten times less. He said, no problem, I need just ten times more atoms. He said, okay, what if hundred times less? So and then what happens if you have no cavity? Can you see this effect? I said, oh, this I don't know. But for the theory, we don't have this with cavities. You can change the parameter, this kappa parameter, the, but without cavities, no theory. I said, okay, let's try it. And we tried it, and we didn't succeed. It didn't work. But we saw something else, which for many years I didn't understand what it was. And then when I went to another conference, different things, uh, PQE, uh, Snowbird, Scully, and he gave a talk about uh, uh, deep cooperativity. And during this talk, I remember very well, we had all this data and we couldn't understand the data. And in my lab book, in my, on my PC, all the files are called anti -cal. I looked, I was looking for what is called cal, and all the experimental uh, evidence was going the wrong way. So I called this anti -cal for many years, anti -cal, anti -cal. And everything was going pointing to anti -cal. And then when I heard Marlon Scully speak about super rate, simple to super radiance at that conference, I think what we see is this. So that's, uh, so I was, 
it, it was just a matter of despair. I was alone in the lab, basically. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so we, we, we saw this article effect, and then we found this big uh, uh, effect, which I will try to comment. OK, I will just say a little bit about this. Uh, and I will drop uh, how we do lambda organization. I will come back to receive and tell you how we do lambda organization <laughs> next time. OK, um, so, uh, so Dick is famous. Uh, also, another story. Dick uh, was, uh, I think it was in Yale, at the same time Anderson was in Yale. But they did really, uh, they had very important contributions to, to science, but they didn't really connect what they're doing. Dick was like in front of optics, Anderson condensed matter, they didn't discuss. And what we want to do at the end of the project is combine Dick is separated to Anderson disorder. So we want to combine Dick and uh, Anderson in our project design. Okay, um, so uh, the French school. So the French school is that from Hamiltonian. So you can do this from Hamiltonian, so we point out everything. The field, the vacuum mode, the atoms, everything. We point out everything. And then, uh, but we only measure something. We have a click on the detector, right? So uh, you have to trace over many degrees of freedom, you don't measure, and so on. So at the end of the day, if you uh, start from a Hamiltonian and you do your homework, uh, which you can do, it takes some time, uh, you come up with this type of equation. So uh, every atom here is a two-level system, for instance, now, first, and we have a field here. And uh, so every dipole here is driven by the by the instant field, and this equation here, this part of the equation here, is the response of the optical coherence of the amplitude of the dipole driven by an external laser field. The rubber frequency here is the proportion of the strength, the amplitude of the uh, E0 here of the field, and it has a phase depending on propagation here. So there's a propagation phase here, which is very important, which some theoreticians forgot to put in, and then you have to do more than that. So it's, it's very easy, just a laser propagating here, and this is just the Optical block equation result for a single atom, a free precession of the dipole, and the decay of the optical coherence. So this part here is just a single response to an external field, which I showed you on Monday, a Tuesday. And the additional part now, which is the interesting part, is that if I take a dipole J here, it does not only see the field from the, uh, the incoming laser, but it also sees the fields related by all the other atoms. So I take the dipole M here, which is oscillating dipole, and this radiates a field to atom J with the 1 over R decreasing amplitude and the phase which depends on the distance between these two atoms. So if you write this up here, you could, you could almost write it directly like this, but you can also the French way derive it from other tones. But it's, uh, this also is possible to derive from Maxwell equations. Mm -hmm. And once you, so you can solve this type of equations, and once you know all the dipoles, you can also compute the light coming out which you detect. So what we detect at the end of the day is light co coming to the detector and we use this equation to understand the physics that's going inside. Um, from this, I will just show you that this equation here, so I give you a, a link on Tuesday on some codes on my webpage. So you Google my name, go to links, and then you click codes from the initial lecture notes. Uh, this equation here you see in these codes. And uh, uh, this is still just changing the parameters of this code, you can publish papers with this. Code. <laughs> so, it's, uh, we played uh, uh, Michel, right? Uh, we change the phase of this, we change this, we publish papers with just with this equation. And there's not everything has been said about on this equation, yes? K0 has to do with external field? K0 is 2 pi over lambda, it's the wave number of the. But uh, it has to do with external Yeah, but it's also, we have two level atoms, so it's very uh, All the frequency are close to atomic person. Add over K0? No, no, no. Okay. So, uh, uh, this K0 is just 2 pi over lambda. And no, lambda, no. Is the, lambda is the frequency no, of the no, optical no, 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 this has no direction. Uh, uh, this is bold, this has a direction, and this is not bold, this is not a direction. Same wavelength. Hmm? Same, same wavelength. Yes, yes, same wavelength. So, you remember the field, <laughs> the standard field, that's the standard. Yes, exactly, yes. Exactly, yeah. Everything is monochromatic. So you're not putting a recoil? No, I don't take recoil. So, uh, okay, so we can, yeah, we, I, here there's no recoil, there's no atomic motion, there's no polarization, there are many things which are okay. This is the thing which you drop anything yes. which is important under the carpet and you have to take it out at some point. But even with this, you can publish papers. Okay, <laughs> okay. <coughs> for instance, this equation here, uh, if you look at the light emitted as a function of, so I come in with the laser beam here on my color code atoms. I look where the light goes as a function of angle compared to the instant light. 
I will see this uh, strong forward peak here, which you can get just from an index of refraction, so mean phi, because the, the cloud of cold atoms here is just like a piece of glass, they're electric, so you get a lens effect. It's also included in this equation. You get a uh, speckle of the node reaction and the random warp uh, uh, diffuse light, which is behind these black points here. The black points here are given from a random warp model. So this equation also has a random warp. And it also has this current backscattering peak here, so it also has big localization corrections. So we like this uh, equation very much because it included mean field, random warp, mesoscopic physics, and we think it also includes under localization. So, it's, uh, so this is why we like this equation. It can study many things on the transition from all these features with this equation. Okay, so um, let me just explain you what Dicke's subradiance is, and then it will be the day. So uh, Dicke studied the paper, what happens if you take many two-level systems? If initially you are all excited, they're all inverted, how long does it take before the energy leaves the system? And what Dicke predicted that it's much faster if you have a collective emission, which is called subradiance, than uh, independent atoms. This has been done from an inverted system in the 70s by Feld. I will not speak about this. What we look at is what happens if you have just a single excitation. So not all atoms excited, just one atom excited. I don't know which one. Uh, then I still have an n times enhancement factor to decay compared to single atom decay rate. And this is much faster. And the other states here are these anti-symmetric states. These we call subradians. So we can understand this for uh, two atoms. Two atoms, if you take two atoms close together, if they oscillate in phase, it's a big dipole, and this emits faster. And the outer phase oscillation is like a quadrupole, which does not emit. So this is a kind of a generalized quadrupole moment, separating state, long lived state. And this is a symmetric a big dipole, giant dipole state. And we generalize this to n atoms. Now, in our experiment, uh, we have also to take care of the fact that our sample size is much larger than the wavelengths. And then this factor of n has to be replaced by another number, and uh, this number is given by uh, this ratio here. So the idea is uh, we are all called atoms, and uh, 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 if you want to emit a photon, then you want to emit a photon. Uh, if you can emit your photon in this direction, and you can emit your photon in this direction, you don't need to speak to each other. But uh, how many directions are available in this room? How many optical modes are available in this room? It depends on how many lambda squares I can fit on the surface of the room. So the number of optical modes in a high-size system is given by the surface L squared divided by lambda squared. So that's the number of available optical output modes. And if there are more atoms than modes, then these atoms have to speak to each other. They have to synchronize or undersynchronize. So the ratio between the number of atoms and the number of modes is this cooperativity parameter. And everything we will uh, do now depends on this cooperativity parameter, which is exactly the same thing you have in a cavity QED physics, except that in cavity QED, any mode is one, or just single mode. And here we have many modes. So it's a generalization of cavity QED without mirrors. So you take this equation I like so much, you can do simulation, you come with the power frames, and, and you see that if you have many atoms together, there's a fast decay superradiance and a slow decay subradiance. And what you can see is that uh, this should scale like this uh, optical thickness. Yeah, one important thing is that this number here is also the own resonant optical thickness which for theory is a nice parameter, but we can measure this in the experiment, something we can experimentally quantify. So we see that the decay rate here goes like uh, the uh, inverse of optical thickness, so the lifetime of this separating state depends on the optical thickness of the sample. And uh, I think I stopped, I will just uh, show you uh, our main result, because this is... Uh, so people have tried to do this many years ago. Uh, people have seen this for two, at two ions, that's the best which has been done, and except this, nothing, basically. You can go to detail, but basically nothing else. Uh, Alain Aspey, whom I know very well, did something, and he, when I tried to publish a paper, I met Alain in Busius, and Alain said, oh, I saw this, why don't you cite us? And I say, okay, because of this, because you wrote in your paper that it's not separated, so we can go, so it's, uh, you have to fight with your supervisor every now and then. Um, and uh, so, uh, what is important is that uh, we, uh, ex we need a large optical thickness in every direction, in three dimensions, and it really depends on this 1 over r uh, green function for scattering from one dipole to the other. So if you know astrophysics or plasma physics, uh, if you have a potential which is case slower than the dimensional uh, system you look at, you get global effects, not local effects. Astrophysics does not depend on local density, but on the size, the so gene stability. So having a long range part here, if this would be 1 over r6, be completely different. So it's 1 over r, 
So it's long-range physics. Uh, this makes it it's a global problem. It happens the global size of the system. And so, uh, again, so this is the prediction for thickness of radius. It depends on this parameter here. Radiation cracking would depend on the square of the optical thickness and depend on the tuning at which you work. So the scaling is very different. The square here, no square here, and detuning depends here, no detuning depends here. So we have to, or under stabilization, you can see. So we have to check for scaling nodes, and this is what we did here. So we change our system. So we come with the, we prepare our cold atoms, switch everything off, and then we come with the pulse of light and see how long does the light stay in the system. And the main challenge in this is how do you switch off a laser? Uh, it sounds easy, but how do you switch off a laser with five or six orders of magnitude of quality? And this is how. So we, this was the limiting factor initially. Once you solve this, you see that we switch off the light, there's a fast decay, and then there's a slow decay here. And if you change optical thickness, the slow decay gets slower and slower. And if you change the tuning, it doesn't depend on the tuning, the slow. And so all this data collapse on a single universal curve. And uh, so and this is uh, the signature of thickness subradiance and not radiation cracking. And uh, I want to stress that here we have two orders of magnitude increase of lifetime. So we don't just change a little bit the lifetime of this collective state. It's two orders of magnitude more than a single atom. If you have a single atom, the lifetime would be one. We have a factor of 100 here. So we have really long late lift states, uh, which is this thickness subradiance state. And this is uh, what we published here. So Michel was. Uh, working on this with William Guerrero. And uh, so basically, if you have a result like this, so Dicke was predicting this one years ago, if you do this, you can eat and live from this for many years. So uh, this is, so going back to I could live only for 10 years maybe. So now I think I can live for 10 years just going around and having this curve here. And in the meantime, you get funding because we did this. So people come and uh, try to get you to work in collaborations to exploit this feature, but this is uh, something we can be used. So we now want to use this for quantum memories. So we get uh, money from the European Union to look at the quantum aspect of this. So once you have a result like this, you can live from it for some time. And so uh, and in the meantime, you do other things. So, so that's the way it goes. Uh, I think I will... Uh, Why is Excuse me? Why is no, okay, here, uh, it's separated for technical reasons, because the cloud, uh, was the smallest cloud here. Now we go a little bit higher. 300 or something like this, so we can go up high. It was a technical limitation in the calibration of, of this number. Uh, I think I will stop here and uh, pop, 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 pop. Yeah, just um, let's see if I have anything very fancy to show you. Yeah, so this, yeah, this is the only thing I want to show you. So what you want to do now, you, so we know how to do thickness up radius. Thickness up radius basically is a, a situation where the photon stays in the system and doesn't escape. So it's like a, like a closed system. So it's almost Hamiltonian. French school again. So ah, we can take, take Hamiltonian. And we play with this and we show that if you're in this uh, approach, you can uh, simulate uh, in the thicker, in the subradiant manifold, you can uh, localize Ella Anderson light, whereas in the superradiant uh, uh, manifold, it doesn't localize. So this is what we want to do now in the next three or four years uh, with uh, the Italian Stop. And of course, this is another way we want to do it. And people, this paper has not been published because basically, basically we, against, we go against the mainstream of the community. We say you're wrong. And so we have come to publish our papers, the theory paper, prediction, but I don't care too much any longer. I have funding to do it. If you don't have the funding, you, you need to publish. Now I don't need more funding. I need to do it. So, it's, um, uh, so this paper has come to be published, but I think it's correct. That's all we're going to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, with this, I. Uh, yeah, this we have ideas how to measure this, uh, look at fluctuations. Also, so one thing we yeah, extract like random listening state. How do I know I have for the localization? At Landike made a mistake in one technique, your math had mistake in another technique. So we have new ideas of looking at the uh, uh, G2 intensive fluctuations and the uh, and the phase transition the fluctuations are enhanced. So we want to look at enhanced fluctuations and the phase transition. That's the way to do it. And with this I and thank you for your attention. Optical density and your sample is not in the in, in the quantum 
regenerate regime, part of the bit. Okay. So what's the optical density typically? I thought also your sample. The spec optical density we can do up to a few hundred, two hundred, three hundred. Okay. okay. So I think okay, so the But the spatial density is very small. I'm sorry, which yeah, the spatial density is small. Yeah, okay. But uh, so in principle you your many orders of magnitude has to do with the difficulty of putting photons inside, right? Yes. Why isn't there a possibility to do a cross kind yes. of no, no, multi-photon yes. excitation inside? Yes, it's possible. It's one of the things uh, we propose in the proposal. Yeah, it's one of the things we do. You can do multi-photon excitation and the put the photon inside. Uh, there's still some controversy on what happens, but this is uh, the equations we use is based on optical coherences, optical dipoles, which oscillate. If you create a population inside, you don't create the coherence. And uh, we have, uh, I have worked with Eric Ackermanns, who is one of the pioneers of this community, which is uh, against the results of the other people in the community, with, uh, saying that if you take a population, initial population, uh, you don't get localization features. If you take initial coherence, you get a localization feature. If so you have a population that's going to turn into coherence, as soon as the atom starts, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but and then yeah, it produces but, other. Uh, and so uh, the thing is, we still, yeah, we. I agree, that's what, that's what I think as well. We have not been able so far to numerically do it because to do this, uh, uh, the, the equations you have to use, you cannot start from this to the optics equation because the population is not part of Maxwell equation. You need to do quantum uh, simulation, it's a two-level system. And that is the quantum treatment, that's for sharp. So what about the pop resonance coherence? No, but this the no. oh, that's difficult. That, that, that's difficult. No, we, that tricks. So we could try to uh, light shift everything away and uh, Created and then light shift it back. So there are tricks to, uh, yeah. So we have to play tricks, but we have others. Yeah, so there are a couple of tricks still to be played. Yes, but how to prepare the initial condition is very important. Yes. Yeah. With many photos, yes, yes, but. Uh, between many sides, yes, uh, but uh, so uh, multi photo. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, so we could prepare something uh, in the, in the thicker type of uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, we could create something not here, but somewhere here, some coherence. Yes. Uh, now, for now, under organization is a, a proposal for non-interacting waves. So two photons is not probably the best idea to start to get non-interacting waves. So to get a non-interacting wave, would be in the single excitation sector. And there are some speculations around that if you go to this part here, you might study what is called now many-body localization. Uh, so the question is, is there a continuous transition from under organization to many-body localization in the multi-excitation sector? Uh, it's First, I want to do this presentation, and then next, the next one. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I think it's a different question. If I understood in your model, just for that multiple scattering, but it's kind of uh, elastic scattering. Yes. What's happened and what's changed if you so we studied this uh, recently now. We, we, uh, if you go in less scattering, this means you increase the drive intensity, and then you go up high, here high, and the question is what happens. So we have a, a, a theoretical proposal from this, this is from uh, The problem is that uh, even if you stay in single excitation sector, you cannot simulate more, we cannot simulate more than 10,000 atoms to slow down. So no, it's very difficult. If you go for the full uh, quantum system, you cannot simulate more than five or seven, seven atoms. So it's very limited where you can do the quantum treatment. And, and so what happens, so we, we did the experiment as well. Yeah. And basically, uh, we have not, so it, I might be wrong what I say now, but uh, one interpretation right now is that if you take the model triplet, so if you go out of resonance, you drive it out, you know that one side of the model triplet is on resonance. And this side that might just be random, uh, random work. Uh, the, the beauty of the ticket subratings is that we could uh, uh, study this uh, here at large the tuning and uh, then we are sure that we can avoid multiple scattering. 
uh, the model is the triplet side that is always on resonance. So you cannot disentangle radiation trapping from uh, subradiant from this thing, so it's difficult. So probably what we see so far uh, is uh, multiple scattering random work of the model side that closes the resonance. We also see increased lifetimes, and uh, that part which might be subradiant as elastic component which survives, and the inelastic part is maybe uh, uh, radiation trapping, but it's under investigation, so it's something that's significant. So it's, it's one of the problems we have. Okay, so let's thank Professor again. Queria agradecer a todos pela presença no nosso 14 Pós de Luz e suas aplicações. Agradecer a todos os participantes, todos os professores, os palestrantes que vieram todos esses quatro dias de evento. É, vocês fizeram o nosso evento muito mais rico, tanto de ciência quanto também de interatividade, de alunos, professores. Né? É assim que se faz ciência, é trocando conhecimento, é se comunicando e visitando outros lugares para poder conhecer também o que os outros lugares fazem, né? Então, quero agradecer a minha equipe do Chapter. Sem vocês eu não conseguiria fazer nada disso. Vocês são fundamentais para que esse evento ocorra. É, agradecer ao nosso advisor por toda a paciência <risos> conosco em relação a tanto a parte financeira quanto confiar também em nós, né? Para que nós possamos organizar esse evento. Enfim, quero agradecer a todos. Muito obrigada por mais um evento que é o nosso simpósio de leis aplicações. Agora, vamos ver a última foto do evento e todo mundo está liberado. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>